I lost track of the number of songs that we have. Good morning. Good to be able to stand before each of you this morning for the purpose of talking about the Word of God. There's nothing that I enjoy more in this life than being able to talk about God and His Word, what He has revealed to us. If you would, I'd like you to turn your Bibles to the book of Genesis. We have been studying from the book of Genesis in our Wednesday evening class, and by the nature of that study, it has not been a in-depth study where we've looked at every detail, everything that there is to see. Uh, because of the nature of the study, what Dempsey is trying to look at is an overview of the, of the framework of the Bible message. But there are a few things that I think are very valuable to us to just kind of stop and kind of dip in and look deeply. And in particular, I want to notice something that we find in the story of the flood. In Genesis chapter 7 and beginning of verse 15, Genesis chapter 7, beginning at verse 15. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh, in which was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered as God had commanded them, and the Lord closed it behind them. I want to talk about that door that was in the ark. When God had given instructions to Noah back in chapter 6, for the construction of the ark, it mentions the fact that there was but one door and one window. And here we see that although the word door is not used, clearly this is talking about that door that God had told Noah to put in the ark. It says that the Lord closed it behind him. There's something interesting about that, something significant uh, about that door. And that's what we want to talk about this morning, not only this door, but a few other doors that we find in the Bible that have great significance, that are uh, much more important than just a slab of wood that uh, latches and, and shuts to protect something or to keep something out. That's what we want to see this morning, is what this door means for us. To understand that, though, we have to kind of back up a little bit and look at the story of why the flood occurred in the first place. We talked a little bit about this this past Wednesday evening. The fact that what we find there in Genesis chapter 6 was a mingling that God had not intended for things to be mingled, the sons of God and the daughters of men. And because of the mingling that occurred there, sin was the result of that, to the point where God tells us that the thoughts of men's heart were evil continuous. It was a world full of people that were intending, thinking about doing evil all the time. But it came about because God, or because man had mixed that which God had separated, that which God had, had caused to be made holy, and man had treated the common. But we know that, of course, Noah was different. If you go back to chapter 6 and verse 8, it says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah alone stands out from the rest of the crowd, the rest of humanity, that he is different than the rest. And that is the foundation, really, for understanding the rest of the story of the flood. That one statement, that Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. In verse 11, it says, Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God. The earth was filled with violence, and God looked on the earth. And behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. But then in verse 14, he tells him to make an ark. The word ark is an interesting term. It's not the normal Hebrew word for a ship or a boat. There were words that were used in Hebrew to describe a ship or a boat, but that's not what is found here. The word ark literally translated just means a box, a container. We learn something about the ark by looking at some of the other places in which this word is used in the Old Testament. Most of them come from the writings of Moses himself. One of them, I'm sure, is very familiar, comes to mind immediately, is found in the book of Exodus in chapter 25, where God, in giving instructions to Moses for the establishment of the kingdom of Israel, tells him to make a box of acacia wood. It was to be 
overlaid completely in gold. And in that box was placed the commandments, the tablets of stone that God had given. It's called the testimony there in Exodus chapter 25. We learned from the book of Hebrews in chapter 9 that it also included the jar that contained that manna that God had used to preserve them in the wilderness. And it contained the rod of air that had budded to demonstrate that he was the one that God had chosen to be the priest. And so these three things were placed into that ark. That ark was a box of protection, a treasure trove, if you will. Interestingly, the other place where this, is, this term is used or translated as ark is found in Exodus chapter 2. And it describes the container that the parents of Moses made for him when he was three months old to place him in the Nile River. Where, of course, eventually Pharaoh's daughter found him and he was raised in Pharaoh's household. That term is also used there. Again, it's not really a ship, but it was a container. And specifically, it was a container that contained something that was extremely valuable. You can understand why Moses' parents would work so meticulously to make this container so well. You understand, of course, the significance of the Ark of the Covenant with the people of Israel. It was so holy, so valuable, that no common man could look at it or touch it. Of course, know the story of us who didn't, keep, didn't treat that box as being holy and died because of it. There's two other places where this term is used. Another one in the writing of Moses is found at the very end of the book of Genesis. When it describes how that Joseph had made instructions that when he would die, that they were to take his remains back to the same land where he had buried his father, the same land that God had promised to Abraham was going to be for all those generations. And it says that when the people of Israel took him back, they took his remains remains back in an ark. We would think of it as a casket, but the bones of Joseph went back in an ark to the land of Canaan. And then finally, very late in the writings of the Old Testament, we find that when King Josiah had read a copy of the law of God and realized how the people of Israel had forsaken the covenant of God so horribly for so many years and determined that they were going to uh, Re reconstruct or renovate the temple and reopen the temple and serve God once again, it says that he put a chest in front of the temple for people to put their contributions. And that word is also, again, the same word that is translated to ark. It helps us to understand in every one of these situations that it contains something of great value that someone wanted to protect, someone wanted to care for. And I would suggest that's very important for us in understanding that story of the flood. I know many of the, the sermons that I've heard, the pictures that I've seen, artists you know, giving a rendition of what the flood would have been like. It shows this great ship with this, this door. And as the waters were starting to rise up, you see people banging on the door, wanting the door to be open. And I thought of the, that door being shut as God saying, no, you can't come. That's not the point. That's not the point of the context at all. In fact, what we find here in Genesis chapter six and seven, and especially what we find in some other passages we're gonna look at in just a moment, is the ark was God's protection for, most, uh, for Noah and his family. Protection from the, the, the waters of destruction. But I would say that's even more so protection from the corruption and the evil that was in this world. They were brought in there to protect them from that which was evil. Look with me at a couple other passages in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an arm for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. The purpose of the ark was to save Noah and his family. Those are the main characters in this story other than God himself. It is all about saving them. Or if we look in 1 Peter chapter 3, 
we of course know very well verse 21, which says corresponding to this baptism now saves us. But go back to verse 20 and see what it is that baptism corresponds to. Who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during which the construction of the ark, in which a few, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Notice the emphasis of law being in the ark. The purpose of the ark was not for those that were outside. It was for those that were inside. God used this to preserve and protect his people. When you think about the work that Noah did in chapter 6 and verse 22, it says that Noah did all that God had commanded him in chapter 7 and verse 5. Again, it says that Noah did all that God had commanded him. Dempsey talked a little bit about the size of the ark. Remember, it was about one and a half times as large as a football field. You think about Kroger Field, not only the field itself, but even the stadium that surrounds it. Gives you a rough idea of the size of the ark. That's constructed by four men without power tools. That's a measure of their faith. That they built that ark as God had told them to do for a reason that they did not yet understand. But that boat, that ark, that box was their salvation. And when he entered the ark there in chapter 7, as I read earlier in verse 15 and 16, it says that when they and all the flesh, the animals uh, that, that God had brought for them, when they came into the ark, it says that God closed the door behind them. This was their salvation. This was their protection. So I want us to consider for a moment what that means for us. What does it mean for us we obviously don't have a large box outside that we all will climb into and God's going to shut the door. But again, I take you back to what Peter said there in 1 Peter chapter 3. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. I think sometimes when we get in these arguments about whether baptism is necessary, does baptism have to be full immersion? And we'll hear the various debates and the arguments about that. We miss the point that is really being brought out here. Baptism is our salvation. It is designed by God to save us. Why would we want to argue about whether it's necessary or not if we understand that it's our salvation? Why would we argue about whether a sprinkling a few drops of water or pouring some water on the head or full immersion is the point when we understand it is our salvation? We have to think about when we're talking about baptism, considering baptism, consider the door of Noah's ark. Consider how that God saved those people and how he wants to save us also. I mentioned there's several other doors that are significant in the Bible that I want to kind of briefly look at and then try to tie this lesson all together. If you'll turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. First Corinthians chapter 16 and beginning of verse 9. Paul here is kind of concluding the letter that he's writing to the church of Corinth. And I know a lot of times by study, a lot of times we do this when we are studying. We get close to the end of a, a quarter of study. And perhaps if we're running a little bit behind, we get to that last chapter, we get to those last, those last statements, and we'll kind of just say, and then Paul had a few concluding remarks. And anybody got any questions about that book? We miss some points when we do that. We miss some significance. Paul here is writing to the Corinthians, and he's writing from the city of Ephesus, and he's explaining to them his work. And he says particularly in verse 8, But I shall remain in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective service has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Now the door of Noah's ark is most certainly real. The door that Paul is talking about here is not any particular door, significant, you know, real door that he could literally turn a knob and open. But he's talking about the fact that there was an opportunity for him to walk through. God had given him an opportunity. 
to be able to walk through and notice he says for effective service. First of all, let's talk about that word why. It's a word that we know very well. It's used all the time in English, the Greek word used. It's mega. You know, when something is mega, that means it's extra big. Well, Paul says, I have a mega door of opportunity in front of me. We know that the Apostle Paul, from the writings that we read in the book of Acts, he spent more time in the city of Ephesus than he did any other location that he was preaching. It was almost three full years that he spent there in Ephesus. We know from tying things together that there was a lot of work that was done in that area, not only the church in Ephesus, but in fact the church of the way Odyssea and Colossae were almost certainly established from the work that Paul did there in Ephesus. We don't know that he ever traveled there himself, but there would have been people who had heard the gospel preached in Ephesus that then preached it themselves in Ephesus the way Odyssey. And so there was a lot of work being done. You can understand why Paul would say there is this mega door for me. The other thing is he calls it defective service. Again, that's a very familiar term to us when we think about it. It's the word dynamo. It means literally powerful. Paul here is talking about this energetic, powerful work that he's accomplishing for the Lord. The message I hope should be very clear to us that when we talk about doors of opportunity, when we talk about what God has put in front of us, that we can be able to serve Him. We need to have the same attitude that Paul did. We need to think of that as a mega door. We need to think of it as powerful service that we can be for our King. Notice Paul doesn't say, I can be powerful. But he says, this door allows me. God has made me powerful. And so there's another door that's very useful to help us to understand it. Notice the last part of that, though, he says in verse 9. This is the part that really just doesn't seem to fit. And there are many adversaries. What do we normally think of when there's lots of adversaries? Oh, that door's been shut. There's opposition here. I just need to do like Jesus told his disciples, shake the dust off my feet and move on to something else. That's not the attitude Paul had. Paul, in fact, still thinks that this has been a mega door and effective service despite the fact or maybe even because there were many adversaries. What was it that Jesus tells him in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? That Paul had prayed three times fervently that the thorn of the flesh would be taken away from him. What does God tell him? He said, my power is perfected in weakness. Maybe we need to understand that when there are those adversaries, that opposition that we face in trying to serve our Lord, it's just a wider door. And we can be more effective as we can demonstrate the power of God in the face of those adversaries. Another door I want us to look at is found in Matthew chapter 25. Of course, you're very familiar with the three parables that Jesus tells there when he was asked by his disciples about the sign of the end. The first one is of the virgins that were invited to a wedding feast. Five of them are described as being wise, and five of them are described as being foolish. And we know how the story goes that as the groom was delayed in coming, the foolish virgins were running out of oil. And they had to go to the marketplace to buy more oil. And while they were gone, there in Matthew chapter 25, in verse 10, it said, Those who were ready went in with the groom to the wedding feast. And the door was shut. Now, I'm sure there's a whole lot of things that went on in that piece, but the only thing that mattered for the purpose of this parable is to say that the door was shut. And then the next verse, it says, they came back and they said, Lord, Lord, open up for us. And he answered and said, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Now, did he literally not know them? They were invited to the feast. I don't think it's a situation where they didn't know him, or he didn't know them. He took note of those that were there when he came with his bride. 
and they weren't above that place. And so he said, I don't know you. That probably sounds very familiar to us. It's found in Matthew chapter 2, verse 33, where Jesus tells his disciples, Those who deny me before men, I will deny them before my Father. Or those in Matthew chapter 7, who will come to him saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, do mighty works in your name? And he'll say, Go away. I never knew. Again, it's not because Jesus doesn't know who we are. But he doesn't know us as one of his. He doesn't know us as one who has accepted his covenant, has accepted his salvation. And the door will be closed at some point if we are not ready. That's what these three parables of Matthew 25 are all about, is readiness. And finally, one more door I want us to look at. It's found in the book of Revelation. This is actually why I developed this whole series of lessons. It was actually a five-part series, but I'm not going to keep you for two and a half hours. But it came from a study that I was invited to do down at, at the Fort Logan congregation several years ago on the uh, seven churches of Asia. And I was given the responsibility of teaching about the church of Philadelphia. It's found in Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. But I want to know particularly what we find in verse 8. Jesus says here, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can show, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. The Church of Philadelphia was widely regarded by scholars as being the smallest of the poorest of all of the seven churches of Asia. It seems to be confirmed by what Jesus says here. You have a little power. Another church was described as being rich and powerful. But this one has just a little power. And yet Jesus says to them, I have put before you a door which no man can shut. Contrast that with the door of the ark which God shut. No man could open. In fact, it's interesting to notice in all of these stories that we've talked about, the Lord is the one who determines whether the door is open or shut. That should be a lesson to us in all of this, is to recognize that God is the one who's in control. God is the one who determines what possibilities we have before us. God is the one who determines what we can and cannot do in his service. God's the one who has put before that church an open door. Contrast this with the attitude that exists in so many small churches. We're just trying to keep from shutting the doors. All we're doing is just simply trying to survive. That's not the attitude that Jesus wanted his church of Philadelphia to have. They did not have. They didn't look at their numbers. They didn't look at their money. They didn't look at their talent. They didn't look at any of the things that man often measures to say how strong a church is. You often hear people talk about, well, what's their attendance? What's, the, what's their treasury? How much do they have in their contribution? How much talent do they have? What do those things matter? What matters is, what do they look at when they see God? Do they see a door that has been opened and an opportunity to serve? That's what we need to recognize. Let's go back to that passage that I talked about earlier in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I want you to look at what God is telling Paul here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning of verse 1. Boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable, but I will go on to visions and revelations of God. I know a man of the Lord who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a man was called up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man will I boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except in regard to my witnesses. I want you to stop at that moment. It becomes clear as we go through the reading that Paul is talking about himself. He says, I will boast about that man, but I won't boast about myself. Well, 
Paul it is you. But what he's trying to do in the reader's mind and our minds is to separate that which is Paul and Paul's power, Paul's ability to do with that which God has enabled. And what Paul is distinguishing is he says, I will boast about what God has enabled me to do. I won't boast about what I can do. In fact, the only thing I'm going to boast about what I can do is what I can't do. My weaknesses. And so then in verse 7, he says, because of the passing greatness of the revelation, for this reason to keep me from exalting myself, there was give me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times, and I depart from me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Paul says, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. It's not that Paul was simply going around and telling everybody about, oh, look at all of my sins, look at all of my failings, look at all of the, the things that are wrong with me. No, what Paul was saying is, I haven't done a thing, but God has done everything through me. Of course, the lesson for us is so clear, really, in all of these doors to understand that it is God who enables us. It is God who gives us the power to do that which is beyond our imagination. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 tells us that God can do more than we can even imagine, exceedingly abundantly more than we can even think or imagine. The only limitation to what we can accomplish for our Lord is our faith. <clears throat> what does it say there in Hebrews 11? By faith, Noah constructed that ark. And the more we trust our God, the more we will find those mega doors that God has put everywhere for us. And we can do powerful service in His kingdom. If you're subject to the invitation, that the Lord has given. There's one more door that I want you to consider. In John chapter 10, Jesus uses three different illustrations, all having to do with the idea of shepherding. But in verse 9, specifically, he says, I am the door. I want you to consider that door that has been put open for you. Jesus is your door. He's your door of protection. He's your door of opportunity. He is your door of salvation. He is the door that you must enter before it is closed. If there's any way that we can help you in coming across, we invite you to come forth now as we sing a song out of this church.